Hi, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. This is Gerald Pasquale with the technical marketing team over at Park Systems. We're the world leading atomic force microscopy manufacturer and uh, solutions provider for emerging nanoscale techniques. Uh, we're very happy that you guys could take some time out of your busy schedules today to join us for a new entry in our 3D printing webinar series featuring Professor Rigoberto Advincula, the director of PetroCase and a professor of macromolecular science and engineering at Case Western Reserve University. This is the latest entry in a 3D printing webinar series that has taken a look at different topics within the space of additive manufacturing and the cutting edge uh, 3D printing techniques. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, the series or with Park webinars bef uh, before today, um, we have a YouTube channel uh, that I'll be linking to towards the end of the uh, talk today that is basically an archive of all the previous uh, webinars that we've done with Professor Advincula with our internal application staff and other speakers around the world from institutions such as the University of Alabama, Indiana University, and the University of Cambridge in the UK. Uh, I'll go ahead and link those again at the end of the session. Um, you guys might have noticed as you've logged in that your microphones are turned off and that's by default to give our speaker an uninterrupted uh, speaking experience. However, we do encourage you guys to type in your questions. You'll notice that in the control panel that has appeared when you joined the session, there should be a section for typing in questions to the moderating staff, myself and Professor Advincula. And what we'll do is as we receive those questions, we will answer them sequentially at the end of the talk in a dedicated Q&A session. Um, that should pretty much take care of it. So uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and turn things on over to our guest speaker, Professor Advincula. Professor? Okay, thank you, Gerald. And of course, thank you to Park Systems for the opportunity uh, to make a difference in 3D printing uh, knowledge. And of course, uh, I acknowledge the presence of our listeners, uh, viewers uh, with, with the uh, series uh, that uh, I have been doing with Park AFM, this time centered around coating methodologies and 3D printing coatings. Now, the um, talk is going to focus on reviewing the needs, the demands for coatings, uh, a little also on the adhesive side. And then at the latter part of the talk, I will uh, focus more on the 3D printing uh, objects and the coatings that are used to finish them or to strengthen them. So this is not <clears throat> a comprehensive review of all the coatings technologies, but I wanted to review the needs as well as the methods for testing perhaps the uh, these materials as the industry is evolving uh, from utilizing coatings in order to produce high value and finished 3D printed parts as well. So uh, with Case Western, uh, just a brief overview, uh, just showing uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, the location of Case Western in a very uh, cultural part of the city. Uh, we have the museum and the Cleveland Orchestra. And with the Macromolecular Science Engineering Building, uh, located at the fifth floor of the uh, Kent Hill Smith Building. Now, most of the work we do on the academic front involves nanostructuring, ultra thin films, synthesis of nanomaterials. Uh, on the other hand, we have lots of uh, experience working with industry in a number of projects and problems ranging from not only coatings, but also emulsions, packaging, uh, vapor deposition, electrodes, and so on. So what we essentially do are trying to bridge the gap between basic research and the needs of the market to performance and efficiency. So I am going to talk to you about 3D printing, especially at the latter part. Uh, the future of 3D printing is uh, spelled out uh, in many ways. One is on the materials side. The uh, recent publications we have on 3D printing uh, at your per use cell, you can 
uh, copy the references uh, or email me uh, with regards to uh, some of these uh, papers. Uh, we have been doing a lot of 3D printing related to uh, improving the uh, thermal mechanical properties of materials, but also uh, the space of looking at uh, different design, uh, 3D printing method and materials convergence means that we can come up with something new. And this I clearly spelled even two years ago when I gave a talk at the World Economic Forum in Dubai. And of course, uh, the Think Box, which is our uh, signature uh, institute for rapid prototyping, access to 3D printing, uh, and technopreneurship, and you are welcome to visit them at their website, and this is a very important resource in our campus. So let's talk about coatings. What do coatings do? Well, primarily, we think of coatings as a protection uh, between the bulk material and the environment. What we sometimes do not acknowledge is that coatings can also protect the environment from the bulk material, in which case it becomes a packaging solution. So there's a two-way street that goes on with uh, thin film coatings that gives a segue to many types of import, important industrial uh, consumer goods, finishing, uh, automotive, smart coatings, different types of printable coatings, etc. In other words, when we eventually talk about 3D printing, we have to deal with coatings. We have to deal with finishing. We cannot accept uh, printed parts that do not have the properties and advantages of a coating material. And coatings can be a very broad range in terms of um, applications, uh, whether we are referring to uh, consumer goods, architectural trains, protective coatings, anti-corrosion, uh, different types of coatings used in instruments and separators. Coatings, as you see, is a very important part of industry. Now, uh, equally important is what goes into this material. So very often, a coating really is a complex, if not a mixture of various additives and components, ranging from the matrix material uh, to things that improve curing, texture, uh, non-wetting, uh, killing bacteria, color, of course, and other anti-corrosion additives. So when we talk about coatings, we have to be talking about the additives in the street. In a way, a coating is engineered by the type of functionality you build in, the improved in performance over time or low maintenance, reduction of cost, and of course, uh, it's all about engineering the coating product. And here you can see that coatings uh, have enormous value uh, in many things from uh, preventing corrosion to strengthening against abrasion and also for uh, solutions that result in, let's say, very good uh, energy uh, savings and consumer acceptance. So let's divide coatings into big buckets. When we talk about paint, when you talk about things that uh, uh, make things beautiful or protect buildings from weathering, we are really talking about architectural coatings. When you talk about coatings that pre uh, prevent rusting of ships, warehouses, or even structures, we call that industrial or, or even protective coatings. Finishing coatings can go to appliances, uh, automotive, or uh, various uh, consumer products. And then specialty purpose coating, of course, can be uh, in terms of transparent coatings, uh, anti-reflection coatings, or things that can be applied both in the factory and the field. Now, along with specialty purpose coatings, we can be looking at high performance. We can look, be looking at marine environments, and this can be applied, as you'll see later, either by uh, casting, brushing, powder, heat, or UV curing. Uh, so in essence, when we have a basic coating material, we can uh, formulate our way towards a new property uh, and then use a transport mode, which can be by spraying or solvent base or different types of powder uh, based materials or solvent uh, systems and then deposit it on a surface or a substrate uh, that we want, uh, in which case 
uh, we will be focusing on a 3D printed object. Now, a coating and adhesive technology is actually as much related to rheology as in the case of flow of materials towards a, a good leveling or flat surface. Uh, hence, we are dealing with the uh, rheology, the thixotropy of materials so that it settles when applied, and of course, the wetting behavior, which can uh, indicate adhesive strength uh, as well. So let's start by looking at viscosity. Essentially, when you first apply a uh, coating material, the coating itself is a low viscous uh, material. However, with evaporation or drying, or simply with time, the viscosity thickens. In that case, you have a window by which you will have a zero shear viscosity uh, uh, element that allows you to control the leveling, curing, uh, coating procedure. So it behooves us to know some of the problems or some of the processes that can affect the coating. That could include coalescence, wetting, leveling, the formation of depressions or painting on corners and edges, sagging and slumping in vertical surfaces. Coalescence, for example, can be quantified by the uh, amount of um, particles are present, the surface tension, uh, the viscosity. So in this case, the particle will coalesce, coalesce to form a larger particle. Larger particles will then aggregate or coalesce to form eventually a film. So one can be talking about the coalescence time. Wetting can be simply defined by the Young's equation, although modifications with the uh, Wenzel and Cassie Baxter approaches can accommodate for roughness. It basically is a surface tension differential between gas uh, and liquid, uh, liquid uh, and solid, and gas and solid. So a good uh, wetting means a good spreading behavior versus that of a higher uh, contact angle measurement. Uh, when we talk about sagging, uh, we need to be looking at the ability of, or the thixotropic behavior uh, to result in a good uh, velocity or constant velocity of flow of the material at the fluid air interface. And this can be a function, of course, of the density, uh, the viscosity, and the flow of gravity, and it can be measured by a change in the thickness. Uh, another is leveling. Uh, where we have the uh, amount of time it takes uh, for a given um, surface area to achieve a level, uh, which we can assay, uh, assay as a flat level in order to achieve a good finish. Uh, this leveling speed can be a function of the um, density, uh, the viscosity, the height as shown here, or the thickness of the film. Uh, and then uh, it can also be uh, specified by the amplitude of that um, undulation. In the case of cratering or depressions caused by uh, the formation of various uh, roughness or surfaces uh, due to the Marangoni effects, so after all, you have mixing and diffusion of gases as they evaporate from the surface. This can be a function or the degree of depression can be a function of the surface tension gradient, the density gradient, as well as the thickness of the film. Uh, another thing that we pay attention to coatings are corner effects or corners uh, where you have an inconsistent uh, coating due to a decrease uh, in film thickness as applied by an inconsistent viscosity of the material or the rate of evaporation. And that goes for corners as well as the inside of a spare type of packaging. So what you can see here is that surface tension and melt viscosity on the coating eventually affects the finish or the appearance in that we want to control the surface tension towards improve um, um, coating, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we have been talking about solutions, but we could easily be talking about 
uh, coatings that are affected by the temperature or melt viscosity uh, indexing of coatings. Now you may wonder uh, what are a typical what are typical coating materials. Well, when we talk about polymer resins, uh, when we hear the word epoxy, polyester, silicone, or polyurethane talking uh, uh, terms, talking terms, uh, we are actually referring only to the chemical structure of the polymer binder involved or the polymer uh, carrier matrix carrier involved. It doesn't include the solvent, the pigments, uh, the other additives that constitutes a coating yet. The term uh, epoxy or polyester is what we sometimes hear or often hear associated with the resin material itself that uh, forms the um, material or the bulk of the material anyway that's delivered on the surface. So if you are curious about what are the chemical structures of a epoxy paint or polyurethane based paint, then these are the chemical structures. Now, when we talk about pigments, pigments play a very important role because they give you essentially the whiteness of the material, the texture of the material. And this can involve pigments that are natural uh, minerals like calcium carbonate, mica, silica, or of course, uh, mined minerals or processed titanium dioxide, uh, thalassanium blue, red iron oxide, and so on. Uh, we can as well be talking about colors and coatings, and that refers to color pigments, which can be based on inorganic or organic materials. Now, sometimes a coating needs to have a specific density, a bulk material, or a viscosity that can be only achieved by appropriating the right filler material to thicken the film, quote unquote. And this is usually done by adding talc, lime, barite, diatomaceous earth, and of course, the pigments itself are solid-based materials that enhance not only the, the hiding power, but also the uh, density uh, of the material. And if you're curious on how some of these natural minerals uh, and diatomaceous earth look like. These are PEM, SEM, and micrograph pictures of some of the additives that can go to your coating. Now, we use the term binder because sometimes we need to achieve a degree of adhesion uh, between the pigments uh, and the other components. So binders basically are the polymer itself or the resin. So Another term you can say about the polymers that constitute the bulk of the coating is the binder polymer, which in this case would be polyurethane, polyester, acrylate, epoxy, and so on, okay? So the binder can be made uh, uh, through dispersions of different types of solid uh, binders, or they can be prepared by emulsion polymerization, in which case, uh, this emulsion polymerization are essentially water-borne uh, materials or they are made uh, as emulsions in water and then the bulk of that emulsions can bind or act as a binder for the rest of the additives. So below you see a perfect uh, leveling of a hexagonally packed emulsion a polymer usually based on acrylates and vinyl polymers and uh, they can be electrostatically stabilized. So you may imagine when you paint a, a material from uh, Home Depot, uh, these emulsions actually pack such that during evaporation of the solvent, the particles form uh, essentially a single layer coating, which then incorporates the additives that you put in. And therefore the coalescence takes place at a thin temperature above PG. Now, you may wonder what, what makes the uh, paint or coating wet. Well, that can be achieved by the solvent. Uh, there's a move, of course, on water-based uh, solvents or water aqueous-based paints. And it will be interesting, I guess, to come up with water-based paints that can be routinely used for 3D printed materials. But the majority of them are basically oil-based or solvent-based materials uh, for durability. Uh, however, um, waterborne paints and latex emulsions 
are good because you don't have to use these volatile organic compounds, uh, which uh, some people find to be uh, harmful if not, uh, uh, does not give you the pleasing uh, smell. So for example, uh, reducing the amount of volatile organic components on any coating is always a good proposition. And that can uh, be said as well uh, with manufactured parts such as uh, 3D printed plastic uh, or even metals. Uh, here again is another picture showing the importance of rheology over uh, the application of a water-based or a solvent-based coating. Uh, so water-based coatings uh, usually have uh, the evaporation, uh, big change in evaporation with the rheological behavior. On, other, uh, on the other hand, solvent-borne coatings tend to maintain uh, their uh, solubility over longer periods of time or activity. And that's, that's a big difference between those two types of coatings. Uh, other additives, well, uh, we may want to beautify, we may want to prevent wetting, or we want to have uh, properties that prevent icing, or even the use of things that can enhance the curing behavior, in which case you need a, a activator, a catalyst, uh, accelerator, or you may even do, need a uh, reaction rate uh, retarder. Uh, you may end up adding things like UV stabilizers, biocides to prevent bacterial growth uh, on the material itself, or coatings uh, or additives that prevent corrosion. Okay, so more or less we've seen some of the basic components, composition of paints. Uh, we even have not talked about thickness. Sometimes we just assume that a particular thickness uh, is good enough because it essentially covers the material. However, aside from the cost of the coating itself, thicker coatings may not mean superior coatings because coatings itself can have a thermomechanical property uh, that is quite different from the bulk material. It could be protective, but it can also be a material that can be easily damaged. Uh, and hence, in many projects, although not specified, the rheological properties of the coating itself is very important. And the rheology of a coating can be related to the ability to control the preparation of uh, emulsions or particles, disperse them properly, and use different types of polymers or additives uh, to enhance their film forming properties. So in the case, for example, with latex paints, uh, let's say water-based paints, sometimes they have to add uh, different types of uh, uh, association modifiers in the case of HEURs that allow associated thickening. In other words, it, uh, it allows for better dispersion of the pigment, the binder, and the latex particles. And this can be in the form of uh, various uh, surfactant compositions or even block of polymer materials. Uh, briefly, we're going to talk about adhesion. So in a, the case of adhesion, uh, we are referring to the wetting of the surface, the collective interaction between similar materials, uh, similar atoms in a um, material uh, a thickness can be seen as a cohesive function. However, a substrate and a a, a foreign uh, material or coating is basically an adhesive function. In other words, aside from wetting, you assume the properties of cohesion and adhesion will work for a good um, binding of these two different materials. So it all again starts with wetting, a good wetting behavior or spreading behavior between an adhesive and a substrate is essential to achieve let's say, a more chemical type of adhesion. But chemical adhesion is really just one factor. In any adhesion process, you have a mechanical factor, a dispersive factor, electrostatic, as well as diffusive factor. So chemical adhesion is the case where you have uh, ionic or covalent bonding between the adhesive material and the surface. Mechanical adhesion can be in the form of interlocking uh, shapes like a velcro or different types of roughness that promote uh, adhesion. 
Uh, dispersive adhesion is in the case of any material held together by weaker forces such as Van der Waals forces. Uh, on the other hand, a stronger force or a form of adhesion can be in the form of electrostatic or even electrical. And then finally, materials do diffuse or flow in that a, a diffusive adhesion, as in the case of many tacky adhesives or pressure sensitive adhesive is depending on the control of rheology. Uh, so rheology between two substrates adhered uh, can be a type of joint, a bond, or uh, the design of a lap joint, uh, in which case a adhesive material uh, can actually be a uh, thermoset, thermoplastic, uh, or cured material. Uh, in fact, uh, there are tables that exist that allow you to explain what type of adhesives are used and good for each specific function. For example, polyurethane is a flexible adhesive that is used in packaging as well as shoes. However, uh, most animal glue, casein, uh, starch are limited to paper products. Okay. Uh, so a little more on coatings and the polymers themselves. So when we refer to acrylate polymers, we refer to uh, polymerized latex particles or the use of acrylate resin chemistry, usually based on free radical cross-linking or reaction, uh, where you have access to these different types of binding monomers. So a very common example, of course, is your hardware paint or the paint that you buy from Home Depot or Ace Hardware, most of them are acrylate-based paints or waterborne latex-based acrylate materials. Uh, and this is just an example of what might go into a acrylate paint. It could be a butyl metacrylate, a methyl metacrylate, styrene, or other types of polymerized uh, materials or the use of acrylic uh, great groups or acrylate groups to promote further cross linking. Uh, I'm not going to use this as a talk for emulsion polymerization, but a lot of these acrylate materials, uh, your DIY paint or your home deep paint, is basically an emulsion polymerized uh, paint or acrylate material. Now, going back to uh, the different types of adhesive chemistry. Uh, the adhesive materials can be the, divided into chemically reactive, evaporative diffusion, hot melt, pressure sensitive, film type, delayed tacky behavior, electrical, and actually what, my, uh, what I should have here on this table are UV cured adhesives. Okay? So one may not think of adhesives as part of the paint, uh, uh, ecosystem, but it is because adhesives play an important role in surface modification. In fact, one of the bigger problems in the, the 3D printing of thermoplastic polymers is that poor adhesion between layers that are printed, which basically relies on a melt type of uh, association uh, that is facilitated by heat. And as you can see here, hot melt Heat adhesion is just but one type of interaction between uh, two materials, okay? So in 3D printing, it's very ripe for adhesive chemistry to get in. Uh, so when we talk again about epoxy, we are basically referring to an epoxy group that can be part of uh, epichlorohydrin bisphenol A chemistry, but epoxy on polyurethane, polyester, or even uh, polystyrene, uh, can be labeled epoxy if the curing behavior is based on the epoxy ring opening with the presence of an alcohol or an amine. Uh, polyurethane chemistry is based on the reaction between a diisocyanate and a polyol uh, or different types of phenols. Uh, phenol formaldehyde adhesive or cross-linking is based on phenol and formaldehyde. And there's more, there's polybenzoxazine, uh, vinyl ester, unsaturated polyurethane resin, I will not be able to cover all those uh, resins used for adhesion. Uh, Photocurable photo resins actually are very familiar to those who use SLA. 
for stereolithographic apparatus in which it involves the use of monomers, initiators, cross linkers that are activated by one photon polymerization. In fact, very often the chemistry you find in photocurable adhesive or coatings are the same chemistries that can be applied for SLA 3D printing. Okay. Uh, again, uh, to emphasize the point, uh, with epoxy, the epoxy usually is prepared as a two-part system uh, involving the epoxy and the diamine hardener. Okay? Uh, alkyd coatings uh, are based on uh, different types of solvents or alkyd, what we call uh, alkyds that are mixtures of, let's say, chemically modified polyesters and vegetable oils. And usually, uh, they contain different types of uh, uh, additives that gives it a very good finish. So varnishing, uh, shiny finish, uh, the presence of oils all makes up for a good alkyd coating material. Uh, polyurethane uh, is used a lot in the field, or whether it's uh, foam or polyurethane protective paint against the environment or a polyurethane top coat on an epoxy coating are used in a lot of external applications for durable and protective coatings. Uh, so of course, we will not uh, bypass the uh, discussion on fluoropolymers. So fluoropolymers, which include PVDF, Teflon, uh, other types of uh, uh, dispersions of um, Teflon or uh, fluorinated copolymers, uh, okay, makes its way actually in high-end applications of coatings that protect it from uh, the environment. Now, in anti-corrosion coatings and different types of chromic, thermochromic uh, materials, uh, conducting polymers are a good uh, type of material that can be used to substitute, let's say, chromates uh, as anti-corrosion components or simply because of their uh, electrochemical, optical properties, they are desirable. And then, of course, we talk about bio-based coatings. So bio-based coatings uh, derive from uh, bio-based feedstocks to make polyurethane, polyesters, polylactides, etc., are considered to be uh, eco-friendly. Uh, Anti-corrosion uh, or protective coatings, uh, again, are summarized here. And these are high-end coatings that are mainly used uh, to protect against corrosion, different types of weathering environments, uh, different types of uh, uh, thermosets and thermoplastics that can be applied in the field or in the manufacturing. So I hope I've given you here a broad and very important survey on what coatings mean and perhaps how it will make its way towards the 3D printing ecosystem. So with the remaining time I have, I just want to emphasize and give some examples of uh, coatings that are making its way in 3D printing. So in additive manufacturing, coatings are actually very important for the growth of this industry. Uh, without emphasizing on failures of 3D printing, and uh, those of you who do practically 3D printing, you will observe, first of all, that you don't get very good finish in that you end up with uh, parts that are layered, parts that actually fail in one direction because of the anisotropy of the printing process, or, or uh, even using powders, you get a very porous finish, as in the case of SLS. Uh, and the best yet in terms of finishing usually comes from materials that are processed, processed by SLA, or where you have photocross linking based on acrylate resin chemistry. So uh, here you can see, for example, a material that is finished by uh, saturating it with the solvent. It gives it a smooth finish, but the but object prior to this finishing, uh, it could be printed from ABS, PLA, uh, polycarbonate, gives you a highly layered object. But by exposing it to solvents like acetone or THF, there's a solvent annealing that takes place, uh, ending up with a smoother finish. Uh, but perhaps it can be accompanied by a loss of resolution on prints itself. So you will find very commonly 
uh, the 3D printing um, uh, products out there that they will also sell you a finishing bath or a finishing chamber, uh, which is actually a solvent evaporated chamber, saturated solvent uh, evaporated chamber that basically dissolves, uh, uh, converts a plastisol surface to a smooth finish. Now, there, another way to make a coating on a 3D printed material is to, of course, brush a coating material. Uh, it can be in the form of a solvent uh, for the polymer to smooth it, a solvent that actually uh, contains other additives or even a paint material that self-levels. And uh, this can be done by adding uh, one, two, three, or many several layers or top coat uh, that provides you that smoother finish or even functionality. Uh, another common way is to actually use a spray material. So a spray is another method of delivery, uh, which uh, of course means that you have a coating that uh, is very op well optimized for spray and nozzle uh, delivery. Uh, other examples can be in the form of uh, sanding, milling, chemical etching, uh, plating, okay. Milling is actually a favored method of finishing, especially with large objects. And I'll show you uh, some examples later. However, uh, you can use chemical etching or uh, with a primer or painting to directly come up with a automotive, a very uh, uh, shiny finish or uh, automotive or appliance, uh, level type of finishing that is uh, quite aesthetic, okay? Uh, here you can see some examples where you have uh, uh, coating that uh, enhances not only the functionality of the material, the aesthetic qualities, but uh, sometimes a clear resin material uh, is necessary in order to preserve some optical functionality. In other words, among the coating uh, procedures and materials I used or showed you earlier, uh, the coating uh, can be required to maintain the optical property, improve the abrasion resistance, uh, improve the functionality against diffusion, and so on. The latter part, for example, is very important for coatings used in very small microfluidic devices or seals. Uh, in that a uh, pro prototype silicone rubber that's been 3D printed actually uh, can be enhanced further by controlling the diffusion of, let's say, solvent uh, or oxygen on a sealant material. Um, in microfluidic chips, which is again another application for 3D printing, the polishing or even internal modification of the 3D printed part or tube is necessary, let's say, for controlling flow behavior and mixing. Next slide, I'm showing you some uh, do-it-yourself kits for smoothing and painting. And some of them are actually sold uh, together with some uh, 3D printed uh, website warehouse. Uh, here you can see that a 3D printed part can be finished by multi-layer coatings. Okay or by the use of solvent finishing. And of course, a formulated coating, as I showed you earlier, can provide not only uh, thermo improved thermomechanical properties, but also uh, aesthetics. So for example, what is commonly used in the automotive industry to give it a high reflection, uh, a shining effect, which could involve the use of metallized uh, aluminum uh, additives and so on can be used for 3D printing. Uh, so here you can see a very uh, interesting finish on a 3D printed part that not only gives you color, uh, reflection, but also perhaps uh, durability. Now, another method of printing can be uh, in the form of metallization. So direct electroplating metallization will involve uh, uh, electroless deposition or electrochemically based uh, the position of a metal on a surface. And sometimes the 3D printed material has to be primed uh, in order to have a higher degree of metal deposition of copper, gold, nickel, uh, 
chromium or different alloys to provide a finish. So uh, in summary, what we can say is that coatings uh, in general are very important uh, because of the added benefit they give uh, in a 3D printed part. Metalized coatings in particular are valued for their finish, but perhaps their uh, protection against abrasion or even uh, conductivity, both thermal and electrical. Okay? The hardness of a material means that you want to achieve uh, a bulk modulus perhaps comparable to that of the 3D printed object itself, because sometimes uh, this property can result in delamination failure. Actually, one of the problems with uh, a polymer that's been 3D printed is that of the changes in the material upon heating or cooling, or depending on the CTE, uh, the uh, coating has to be well matched with the 3D printed material. And of course, safety. And you've seen a variety of the different types of paint and coating materials that are used for applications. So some examples, for example, uh, as shown here, are actually commercial processes that help improve the finish of a 3D printed part. As you can see here, you can have a lightweight metal-like fixture 3D printed uh, or even a finished uh, material that uh, has a very good roughness uh, uh, function. Now, I visited Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, the uh, manufacturing demonstration lab, uh, laboratory land run by uh, Dr. Love. And these are some of the things that I'm showing you uh, that may be of quite importance. So, for example, a big uh, BAM machine or uh, a ma machine capable of making very uh, big parts uh, or printing parts that uh, are based on high performance polymers like PEAK or PPS uh, are very important not only for their thermomechanical properties but also they're finished. As you can see on the right, uh, actually the bottom of the chair, a BAM printed uh, chair has a corduroy-like finish, but applying a proper uh, finishing uh, agent or even the use of milling, sandpaper, uh, different types of uh, powder or solvent delivery of a coating of perhaps similar material can produce you a smooth fully finish. And that goes for things that perhaps are used for mold press or injection molding surfaces or different types of uh, aesthetic finish. So for example, you've seen the uh, Cobra, Shelby Cobra, uh, a famous car in the 1960s that was uh, prepared, uh, was 3D printed at Oak Ridge. Uh, this car was resurrected, 3D printed, and the last part involved a very good automotive finish. So in the end, you have a 3D printed Cobra uh, in which the finishing played a very important role in producing this aesthetic quality of resurrecting that sports car. And lastly, during my visit there, I actually uh, sat at this uh, resurrected Willis Jeep you can see here parts that are actually 3D printed, but you would not tell a corduroy finish because of the good job they've done in uh, giving it a shiny metallic finish with a green army green U color uh, that was present on uh, that object. So with that, I'd like to finish uh, the talk. Be happy to answer any questions from you. And uh, let's go on from here. So thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Advincula, for the uh, illuminating talk today. And that was a really nice picture of you over there in the 3D printed Jeep. I enjoyed that one. Um, let me see here if we have questions from the audience. It appears that we do. So we'll start with those. Um, oh, okay. One is just a general administrative question. Um, will the presentation be shared with the audience? So it's going to be shared uh, in, in at least one way. Uh, like I mentioned at the top of the session, all of these webinars are recorded, and uh, they will be put up in about a week or so on the Park Systems YouTube channel. And I guess this is a good time for me to uh, drop that link into the chat. So 
I'm going to go ahead and dig out that URL. And uh, you guys should see a little public chat room in your control panel. Uh, the URL is now there. So feel free to go ahead and bookmark that uh, in your web browser. Uh, not only will you see the coding methodologies 3D printing webinar series on there, but also the other series that Professor Edvinkel has done with us, such as the nanomaterials and also a 101 um, a series as well, just on basic uh, poly polymer chemistry, and also all from, uh, from all our other speakers as well, including uh, application staff from Park Systems for more in-depth SPM talks. Okay, so uh, hopefully that answers your question, Min. Um, for those of you who are still um, wanting to ask questions, please send them in, type them into the questions module. We'll answer them sequentially. Uh, the one question that I had here, Professor, is um, obviously we went over um, particles that are being added to coatings in order to give them particular properties, such as protection against marring or corrosion or even UV resistance. Um, what are some of the more esoteric particles that you've seen added to coatings? Like, have you heard of um, coatings that make use of, let's say, nanotubes or, or like buckyballs or anything like that? Uh, yes, Gerald. Uh, and actually, that that can be the subject of a future talk, uh, the use of nanomaterials in 3D printing, but also in coatings that uh, can be used for 3D printing. Uh, the use of nanomaterials or their nanostructure in coatings means that you can control the diffusion behavior, uh, uh, the diffusion behavior of oxygen to a coating, uh, sort of a protective uh, barrier layer. It can be used to provide further uh, control on the thermal conductivity, electromagnetic shielding by incorporating, let's say, carbon nanotubes and graphene, or even antimicrobial properties of coatings based on the presence of graphene. Uh, uh, so yes, nanomaterials will, make its way in coatings used for 3D printing. That's for sure. OK, very good. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, you are also free to contact Professor Advincula. As you can see here, um, here is his email address. It's rca41 at case.edu. And um, to reach Park Systems, since we were just talking about using nanoparticles in coatings, uh, if you have any need for nanoscale characterization via scanning probe microscopy, um, the updated URL, the updated web address for our website, it's changed now. It is now parksystems.com. Uh, some of you, I've seen some familiar names in here, might remember we were at parkafm.com. That still works, but uh, the new address that we'll be using forward for our website is parksystems.com. You can reach us there as well. Um, okay, we have another question from the audience. How do you control the thickness of coatings applied on small parts that have critical dimensions? Um, is there any need to worry about the reducing effect on polishing? Yes, so actually I, uh, that's a very good question and that's why I, I made basically a, a review on the different failure modes or methods of uh, coatings as well. Usually the thickness of the coating is a function of uh, several things. One is the viscosity of the coating itself, the uh, ability to diffuse over time. Uh, that means uh, if you apply a coating either uh, by uh, brushing, uh, dipping, or even spraying, you will eventually have different thicknesses over various parts and after all we still live in gravity so that controlling that uh, thixotropic uh, behavior is essential rheology uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, uh, you know painted uh, viscous liquids but even with powders during uh, the melt curing or fusing uh, uh, as they form as a single layer, uh, you can still have this positive problem. So among the other things, I can, of course, mention the shape, the geometry, 
uh, the uh, evaporation rate. But the single biggest factor uh, is the control of rheology. And if you plan to uh, coat several layers, that simply means that you can build up uh, different thicknesses over time, uh, or you can apply a uh, coating that acts as a leveler or self-leveling mechanism uh, to reduce those imperfections. Okay, very good. Thank you for the question, Joe. Um, all right, so it looks like that is the queue of questions so far. Um, I'm going to give you guys a couple more moments to type in any last minute questions you guys may have that the professor can answer uh, live here on the webinar. Um, I am going to segue really quickly into just a couple of announcements. Uh, if you happen to be in the uh, Texas area, uh, that's kind of a huge state. Uh, let me refine that a bit. If you happen to be in the uh, greater Houston area around Houston or Webster or so, we are going to be, um, or actually Professor Advincula is going to be having a uh, codings uh, conference uh, at the end of this month on the 26th and 27th. Isn't that right, Professor? Yes, I, I, I like to invite our audience for the advanced coatings conference uh, that will be held uh, essentially in two weeks at a, uh, April 26 and 27 in Houston, Texas. Uh, you can find out more details about that conference www.advcoatings.org or advcoatings.org and uh, uh, you will have lots of details there and uh, of course, uh, that's an opportunity for you to learn more about park systems, AFM systems as well. That's right. We'll have a table there as well. Um, for those of you, again, who are interested in that conference, uh, please check out the uh, the website Professor Advincula just mentioned. I also typed in the uh, URL web address for that there. So yeah, feel free to drop by the website, check it out if you're interested to learn uh, about learning more about codings and if you're in the area. Um, let's see here. Well, the only other announcement that I have is the 3D printing uh, webinar series will continue again next month. We are going to be focusing on the topic of plastics and the, um, the circular economy of uh, plastics as well. So please keep an eye out on parksystems.com as well as in your email inboxes. We'll definitely be handing out uh, you know invites for those and as always, you know, all of these webinars are free and open to the public, and they're also uh, archived as VODs, videos on demand on our YouTube channel as well. So uh, with that, as no questions have entered queue, uh, I believe it's now time to close the session. Um, any concluding thoughts, Professor? Yeah, again, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Uh, some of you have been following this series for a while. Again, you can reach me at rca41 at case.edu, and I'd be happy to respond to you uh, in your questions. Thank you, everybody. And again, this is Gerald with the technical marketing team at parksystems.com. Um, you can reach us for any of your SPM needs, or if you have any needs at all for nanoscale characterization, definitely visit our website. So until then, thank you, everybody and have a wonderful day. Take care.